Hello, peaceful revolutionaries. This is Sylvain Rochon speaking. How are you today? Um, today, I decided to do something uh, a little different this week. Um, I, I keep talking about social issues. I've, I've done a bunch of videos on the uh, cash reactors. And there is one upcoming probably uh, next week, actually. So I'm going to give you an update on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, j just scientific breakthroughs and things like that. One of the things that I also want to talk about in, uh, in some of my videos is uh, business principles because, you know, let's be honest, we're a little bit like black sheep. We are extraordinary individuals. We don't necessarily fit in as employees in, uh, in normal structures of society. We tend to go on our own way. Um, so most of us tend to need or want to be entrepreneurs, to be in business for ourselves or be contractors because we want to work our own thing, do our own projects. We want to revolutionize. We want to create, right? We want to do something different and we want to help people. Uh, that means most of us don't really fit in the structure of society that are imposed by the big powers you know, as in like just do a good job go home sleep don't ask any questions kind of deal um so one of the things that i that i do professionally is i uh, i consult and advise people about uh, starting their own business because i've done it a few times and i'm still a consultant i haven't worked uh, at a i guess quote-unquote real job uh unless that was a very specific purpose for it since I was a teacher that was 12 years ago <clears throat> at least. Um, so, but, uh, so I've been helping people starting their own businesses and, uh, and some of them have done really, really well. Uh, and also what I've been doing uh, over you know, the more recently, I guess as a, as a consultant, I've been matching investors with startup businesses uh, so that they could find each other and uh, and do business together. But sometimes businesses do need funds, uh, and uh, so I, I do some of the matching like that for mainly big projects these days. You know, you know, over a million dollars um, is actually easier for me, just because of the type of uh, investor groups that I'm dealing with. Um, so anyway, so what I want to do today, I want to talk about the pink whistle. Uh, this is <laughs> now that, that's why it's on the, it's on the thumbnail of the video. If you clicked on it, um, this is something I use as an example. Because there's there's three key elements in starting your own business in your own way, and, and they are actually fairly simple, uh, but they are super important for anyone that wants to do their, their own business. Because honestly, a lot of people just don't. They figure get a good idea, get money spend to get things going get this uh, get things produced whatever and then uh, and then you just sell right that's what people think but that's really not the way it works um, unless you already have done business before and you've already sold business before you've done it a couple of times then you can actually take that approach because you have the experience to actually get that done uh, and you know a bunch of people that want to fund. They know you. They know you're reliable, and they, they know you, you're generating success and things like that. The, uh, not a lot of people have done that uh, several times. So uh, I'm talking to you guys who are probably probably want to go at it for the first time. You want to be in business for yourself. You want to do something cool, uh, but it's going to be your first uh, success and it don't be afraid of failures by the way these are failures are great just be sure to fail fast so you don't like spend 10 years uh, at something that is essentially a, a dead end or a dead horse uh, you want to fail within the first six months decide okay this is probably not going to work and the principles I'm going to provide to you will will allow you to identify you know success versus failures fairly quickly so that you can move on to the next idea or grow that idea properly, right? So, important things. A thing that is uh, that is number one. The number one item on your checklist out of three is find your pink whistle. And what I mean by that is you have to find a unique value proposition. And you've heard that before if you've had to seminars and things like that. But in the, the I always found that it's uh, it's hard to image, so I'm using the pink whistle as an example. It's something that's fairly unique. You 
very few people probably are looking for a pink whistle. Uh, but they exist. They are sold. They are produced. They're they're somewhere, right? So, what you want to do as a startup business, uh, when you have a great idea for a product that's unique, you want to see if other people are doing it, right? Uh, like if other people are doing, are, are creating, or selling uh, pink whistles, and likely there are. Uh, but you know, if you look at the web for pink whistles, for example. You're gonna find a bunch of stuff, but you won't you won't find somebody that like a website or a seller that specifically focuses only on that on making the best pink whistles possible. You don't really find that expert. Uh, so that's a good the good sign for an idea if nobody's actually doing it. Uh, and then you you figure out okay well, is there a need for the pink whistle? Well, I'd assume uh, the whistles are purchased. They've been around for a long long time. I would assume. A lot of people are looking for the pink variant of whistles. Why not? Okay, so that's your market. Now, let's imagine we are a manufacturer of a pink whistle, using that as an example. And we want to sell our pink whistles. And we're because we're specialists, and this is our focus product, we really like that. We know how to make it the right color, the right shape to attract the people that want those whistles, right? Uh, and we're really keen on that. Uh, doing all the detail work that's specifically for that demographic that really enjoys that, that are fans of pink whistles, okay? Let's say we're an expert at doing that. How do we get, uh, how do, do we get it out there? And, you know, the, the idea of the pink whistle is exactly, uh, actually focuses or channels, challenges, uh, channels your efforts into doing the right thing. Because that is a unique value proposition, the pink whistle. Because if you don't find that unique value proposition that is your own, that pink whistle of yours, what happens is that you're selling to a much larger audience. You're selling maybe a lot of whistles or a lot of little knickknacks. Well, guess who's selling a lot of knickknacks these days? Walmart, uh, Lowe's, uh, you got, you know, name them, like huge international conglomerate, conglomerates of, uh, of uh, uh, companies that you have no business in competing with. None at all. So you have to find what is that product or service or key element that makes you appealing to a certain tranche of people. Because a lot of startups, what, they, what they're looking for, they're looking for the big buck. They want to sell to as many people as possible. Having a big market is great. But you have to have a pink whistle. To have, you have to have a unique value proposition. It has to be, to be as special as it can be, and sell to an appropriate amount of people. So, you know, if you sell to, let's say, if your market is one percent of the United States, right? That means between two and three million people that are your clientele. And what I mean by selling to 1% is that, well, these, these 1% are people that are looking for what you have, for your product or service, for your pink whistle, so to speak, right? So if only 1%, 1 of these people want to buy, well, that's 2, 3 million individuals. And what happens is that these 2, 3 million individuals, when they are looking for what they're looking for because they're, you know, they're, this is your demographic. They're looking for pink whistles. They're constantly looking for those. Where are they finding them? They're finding them at dollar stores. They're finding them at Walmart. They're finding them at random stores that sell a whole huge whack load of knickknacks. So they type in perhaps on the internet, on the internet to, to find at, at Best Buy or Walmart pink whistles and they find the selection here and there, right? And then they go and and and, and, do, and they they go and buy their whistles or they order order them off eBay or whatever they 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 end up finding it. That's how you know they uh, they actually are uh, two or three million people that want your thing, right? It's because there there's actually a market for it. But what you what you're selling is that you are the expert at pink whistles. You are you should be the prime contact for those two, three million people that are looking for your, your stuff. And if you know how Google works, Google search works, 
that it works by priority and by by uh, what you want. Like if, if you're searching a lot for pink whistles, let's say on your computer, then it's gonna it's gonna give you the best relevant results. So if you make an online shop that specializes uniquely in pink whistles, and you advertise it a, a little bit. Google is going to put you at the top of the list on the first page when people type in Pink Whistle, right? So then you have a specialized shop in Pink Whistles that is easy to find for the people that are looking for that, that product. Not only that, but guess what? If you're a Pink Whistle aficionado and you, fi and, and you find that shop and the price is right and you have a variety of Pink Whistles because you're a fan, where are you going to shop? Are you going to shop at that specialized shop that caters to your specific need? Or are you going to go to Walmart or Dollarama to find that whistle, which may or may not be there because it's full of stuff in there. And you're going to maybe you're going to find one type, maybe cheap or whatever, because it's not specialized. You see what I'm getting at? So your pink whistle is that unique thing. could be a service. I'm going to give you some examples from uh, companies that were mentioning Walmart. It's pink whistle is wholesale bulk buying. So they bought, they have a huge stores, huge inventory. And so they, they transfer that savings in cost, which is bulk cost with a low uh, profit margin. Well, low enough. I mean, they're making a lot of money, but they, they can offer a better price than the competition because they have a huge store. So their value proposition was, well, okay, we're buying our huge amounts. And we're, we can, and therefore we can sell at a cheaper price. So their clientele are people that are looking for best prices. So a lot of families, for example. Uh, let's look at Starbucks coffee. Starbucks, especially, is in coffee. Its value proposition is not only coffee. There's a lot of gourmet coffee shops here and there, uh, like little shops uh, in different corners and things like that. What Starbucks was able to do is they're able to offer excellent coffee. They priced it high, not because it necessarily costs three dollars fifty for a coffee. It doesn't, to be honest. But because it's a prestige play, they offer the coffee in the shop in a where, where you, you get a feeling that it's prestigious. You I mean you, you got a high class coffee, and all their branding is about class. When you're getting coffee fix, but you're you're, you're it's, it's like bourgeois it's like classy in comparison you have tim hortons at least over here in canada i know in the United states you don't have that uh the coffee is really really cheap but it's super popular these are for the guzzlers and the family members and the workers they just want to grab their coffee you, know, you have lineups out to the streets and at tim hortons over here uh, in the mornings but people want to have their morning coffee all they want they don't care about the prestige they just want to have a, a great coffee and they were able to get a really good blend and then you can grab a donut breakfast and different things like that uh, at the same location and it's grab and go it's really quick it's like a dollar fifty you get a really great coffee and there's no i mean the, the cups are full of branding and and, and uh, uh, competitions and things like that because the appeal is for families and workers and people that just don't care about the prestige. And these two, uh, these two uh, franchises are actually in comp competition here for the coffee, but they offer a different experience for, uh, related to coffee. So the unique value proposition is, is the experience and what you're, it's not about the coffee so much, although it has to be quality. But about the experience, like you, you, you grab you grab your coffee and go and just have a great coffee and get your coffee perk, or you got an experience and you can show people that you're drinking at Starbucks, and you know that's that's great coffee. I'm willing to pay three fifty for my coffee, and it's a coffee from Morocco from this other location, and it's still fairly quick with the baristas, and you you can go Wi-Fi and things like that. And you imagine inside is actually a different experience that they offer to a different clientele. Okay, these are a couple examples like that. So that's number one, the pink whistle. You got to find that unique value proposition that has a market. It has to be, it can be small, but it has to be big enough to sustain your business. And you don't want to have too many comp competitors in that specific space where they offer the same value proposition. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is MVP, minimum viable product. Once you have your unique value proposition, uh, yes, uh, you want to get started with 
something small. Why? Because you want to hit it or, or kill it early as a business. Because it's an idea. Even though you did your research, you found your pink whistle, you're, you, you have your demographic, you don't know for sure if this is going to work out. It needs to, to be tested in market. You need to start selling the pink whistle on, on your website and see if you actually are drawing sales. Is it going to be sustaining? Is, are there other competitors out there that you uncover over time like fairly quickly? Uh, you know, what other problems are coming out of it? You want to ID that fairly early, right? So you build uh, a, a system. You build a small business that is around the minimum viable product. So you you build, for example, I'm using the example of Pink Whistle again. You build your first Pink Whistle because you're the specialist. You're the expert, right? You build the ideal Pink Whistle, only one, and you start selling it online with a simple website that's you do it yourself using some systems like Wix or, or PageCloud or WordPress, whatever, and with a little shop, and you start to advertise, and you see if it takes. And you talked about it to a lot of people. Maybe you know the Pink Whistle aficionado circles, and you advertise it to, to those, and you, you get a feel for the market by spending as little time and money as possible, but, but delivering a high-quality product or service because you want people to like it and come back and talk about it. So you still have to have a business plan, okay? Uh, so you, you build a small product possible. People make mistakes at this stage as well. They figure, okay, I have a unique value proposition, but I have to go everywhere with a gazillion products and variants, and I have to show – no, no, no. Start small, test the waters, and then from the revenues, because you, you get some metrics, then you can do one or two things. You can do either – uh, you can either, um, geez, I'm having brain fart. <laughs> you can either, either get new variations to kind of extend your catalog by using those revenues and kind of like make more spend in marketing uh, according to a cer certain strategy, right? Or if you, if your idea requires funds to extend and, and go beyond, then you can go after investors, friends and family, angel investors, uh, venture capitalists, whatever is needed, make a loan from the bank to extend and expand and do something better. Because you've already tested the market. You know it works. And you can do graphs saying, well, if I had more types of whistles because I had feedback from people, they wanted this way, they wanted this way, then to, to create that catalog, it's going to cost me, I don't know, $20,000. I can generate that over three months in sales, or I can raise some money to actually uh, do that faster. You can make those decisions at that point, okay? Um, so uh, so that's that's really the key. Your MVP is, is your, your, your springboard. If you don't have a lot of sales or you didn't wait, waste a lot of time, if it doesn't work and you don't see it's going to trend anywhere, then basically you kill the idea, you pivot, or you maybe you need to change something fundamental or change product or change service, find another unique value proposition that will work and you, you, you rinse and repeat. You try it again until you get something that will work, right? Third key, you're not alone, okay? Very important. Excuse me. You have to realize that maybe making the MVP means that you need to do things that you're not able to do, certain things, for example. Uh, I'm in software a lot, and so I meet a lot of excellent engineers, software engineers. They make great games, great programs, great things like that, but they have no idea about business. They have no idea about how to grow a business, how to sell, and things like that. So they're, tr they're trying to do it on their own where they don't have really the, the mindset to do the other things that they're unfamiliar with but they, that are needed to grow a business. Okay? So, so what's, uh, what's best is that they should associate themselves, partner up with people that know these other things, that have grown a business before, for example, and you share the business with them. They may be excited about your, uh, about your product and service. Uh, because they're not technical. They don't know how to program. They don't know how to build pink whistles. They don't know how to do these things, but they know how to grow a business. And you find these individuals, and you associate, you partner with them. So you get to do what you're best at, and they get to do what they are best at. 
And one form of that is uh, of that association is to get a uh, an advisory board, or get a mentor, or get a coach like like me, for example, uh, that that has coached before, that knows how to go through the steps, and you let them make the decisions a little bit for you and coach you through the uh, through the the process and get you where you need to go. Okay. Um, and so, so you're not alone. You need to kind of surround yourself with people that fill in the void, that are good at other things that you're not good at, but are, that are essential. Once you get all these three pieces into play, you got something. Right? And with the expertise, number three, with the expertise uh, of others, you can probably grow out of that MVP and move forward in sales with some comfort because let me tell you if you're alone with that idea it's a pretty lonely place to be and it's better to have 20 percent or 25 percent of something big than to have a hundred percent of nothing if it goes nowhere so find the right partners be patient get it going get somebody that has more experience in what you where you need to go right uh, and if you have something really good if you have a good MVP if, especially if you have a, some sales already it's fairly easy to find a partner that will want to, to partner with you to drive it forward because they want your product. They can't do what you do. Okay? So that's why partnerships are really, uh, really important. So that's going to be it for today. Hope uh, I hope I was helpful. If people want me to talk more about these kind of things and have specific case studies or ideas uh, they want me to uh, to talk about. You know, feel free to comment. I always appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel uh, to kind of keep up to date with everything that I that I talk about. You know, and uh, and for sure, I'm going to go back to some. I'm going especially if there's a lot of comments about it. I'm going to circle back to business concepts uh, as needed. Uh, I go from my uh, on my whim and on my on need and, and comments from people. Uh, you know, depending. Uh, for for what's in the next video? Uh, so for the time being, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you all are working on some project that will change the world. I know I am, uh, and I'll tell you about the, about the new project I'm, uh, I'm involved with uh, soon. I hope, and um, yeah, just uh, generate some success. That's how you change the world. All right, peace out. Ciao.